Warning, by the time I finish this sentence, this podcast will already have started using words like fuck. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by My Sheets Rock, Factor, Stamps.com, and by all the patrons that help make it happen. And if you're thinking about joining them, May is the best month to do it. Matreon is still going strong, and we're on pace to have to get coffee enemas. Learn more at M-A-Y-T-R-E-O-N dot com. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hello, this is Bane Shakes Charlie. Anytime one of my YouTube videos mentions LGBTQ plus rights, or determinism, or any degree of political literacy, or even just that video game women aren't required to be pornographic, the comments section quickly reminds me that we did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey men, women, and inbies. Thursday. It's May 16th. And it's the International Day of Light. All days are days of light, stupid holiday. Yeah, right? <laughs> I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. Fuck you and your holiday. <laughs> Dumb. I'm Heath Enright. And from Samuel Alito's, New Jersey, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, Father McHale commits a real boner. A German church tries to party like it's 1989, Taylor's version. And we'll marvel once more at how bad the world's most popular apologetics book is. But first, the diatribe. Yo, those motherfuckers came from my library and I wasn't even there. So here's the story from the, from the Okefenokee Regional Library in Waycross, Georgia. In 2022, the library decided to put out a string of rainbow flags for Pride Month, and they got such a positive response from the LGBTQ community, who, let's face it, they're not super used to feeling welcome in Waycross, Georgia, that they decided to just leave those up year round. And so predictably, a couple of fundamentalist Christian assholes freaked the hell out about it. And in rural South Georgia, fundamentalist Christian assholes have a lot of dick to swing. So pretty soon, a coalition of churches started a campaign to get them removed. They'd be damned if their library was going to be welcoming and inclusive. And the library wasn't looking to pick a fight. So ultimately, they decided to remove the flags and not put them out again until Pride Month. But they still wanted to send that message of inclusiveness that was so important to their LGBTQ patrons. So they put up a mural that says libraries are for everyone. And below that, there's these little stick figures representing different identities. There's a figure in a wheelchair, a figure in a hijab. There's white figures, black figures, brown figures. And one of them is a figure holding a rainbow-striped heart. Well, the local bigots took that as a poke in the eye and they redoubled their efforts. They demanded that A, that mural be taken down, B, that mural not be replaced with some other gay shit again. We already fell for that one. And C, that, and yes, this was included in their fucking petition, the library's policies be changed so that trans people have to pee in the wrong bathroom. And there was a huge fucking fight about this for over a year. Lawsuits were threatened. Christians protested. People showed up at the library in goddamn Proud Boys t-shirts to intimidate the librarians. Funding was withheld from the library for reasons the city's commissioners swear have nothing to do with the mural. That would be a clear and obvious violation of free speech, so it couldn't be that. Anyway, like so many stories about prejudice in the state of fucking Georgia, the bigots won. Last week, the board voted to take down the mural. Local churches had successfully bullied the library into rescinding their everyone is welcome here message. And LGBTQ people in this city were reminded of their place. Now, you might be wondering why you're just hearing about this now. Right. Like, after all, the scathing community could have probably lent meaningful support to this effort. There was a legal defense fund for the library that you could have contributed to. There was a petition to save the mural that you could have signed. And at the very least, we could have overwhelmed the bigots in their online arguments about this. And here I am just telling you about it after the fact. Why? Because I'm also just learning about it. Religious bigots have been fighting social justice in my hometown. And the epicenter is less than a mile from my fucking house. And I didn't hear about it until it was over. And believe me, I've been kicking myself hard over that. 
you know, there was a public comments period. There was a meeting where they invited members of the community to come speak for or against the mural. I could have diatribed right in those homophobic Jesus freaks fucking faces on the record and they'd have had no choice but to take it. And I missed my fucking window. I missed it because I know more about anti-trans legislation in Tennessee and anti-gay legislation in Florida and anti-atheist legislation in Washington, D.C. than I do about what's going on in the town I live in. And since I learned about that the other day, I've been asking myself a lot of whys. Like most towns, ours doesn't really have a local paper that you can subscribe to anymore. And sure, there are Facebook community groups that I could belong to and local meetups that I could attend, but I don't. And it's because, get this, I don't feel welcome at them. There's always a bunch of Christian bullshit. I can't join a local Facebook group without being inundated with God help me so much today and my church is seeking funds and Jesus loves you bullshit. The constant stream of Christianity bigotry and Christian bigotry has driven me out of every local group I've ever joined in this area. But that's the point, isn't it? The whole idea is to be exclusionary. That's why they want to put the Ten Commandments out front of the fucking courthouse and in God we trust on the wall and have a prayer before the meeting. These are all different ways of telling the non-Christians that we are unwelcome in our hometowns, that we have no role to play in the city's governance, that we are forever outsiders. The whole reason people take to these Facebook groups to profess their love of Jesus is to push out the non-Christians. And even for a person like me, it worked. When the LGBTQ community in my town needed my voice, I was home hiding from all their Jesus shit. Look, as I'm coming to realize, for a lot of us, we're all the watchdog our towns have. With the death of local papers, if you live in a town of less than 40, 50,000 people, you might well represent the entirety of that town's available secular activism. And that's why Christians are working really hard to keep you away from the city's meetings and friends of the library groups and every other civic organization that might help you keep abreast of all the fucked up shit their theology is doing. You know, online organization is great. It offers a like-minded community in places where geography would never allow for that. But we do still have to be active on a local level, even if that means seething our way through the occasional invocation or opening prayer. And even if you have to be the only atheist in the room. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the wheel and pulley to my inclined plane, Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to be a bunch of tools? I wrote wheel noise to myself here, and I don't know what a wheel noise is. Ooh, spinning. Okay, but this does bring up something important to me emotionally. I do think it's weird that wheel and pulley made the same list of simple tools as wedge, right? Like wedge. (laughs) Right, plus wheel obviously gets two turns. Yeah, okay. exactly, because the wheel and axle and pulley. The pulley's just yeah, a wheel Yeah, it's actually with the rope. wheel and axle, right? Thank well, you. Yeah. All right, well, I need to, a quick break now to write a formal apology to all the big Wedge fans that are bound to write in, so we're going to pause for a word from this week's first sponsor, My Sheets Rock. And so when I say go, you're just going to punch it. Okay, are you going to count? I don't know. I was thinking I'd sort of feel it out. What? Like, don't feel know. it out. Do a count. It's like Top Gun. Hey, guys, wait, uh, is that a jet engine? Sure is, Noah. At last, I'm going to sleep better than ever. Sleep better than ever? Yeah, me and Eli are warm sleepers, but with the wind this baby will kick up, we're going to be sleeping cool all summer long. Guys, if you're warm sleepers, why don't you just try the regulator sheets from My Sheets Rock? What are the regulator sheets from My Sheets Rock? What? No, you can't. I claim the midnight. A cord. No, absolutely. Get get out of here. Get no, out of here. That's right. The clock just struck in the Fey mood. Come on. Point. Eat it. Thank you. How did I not Thank know you, that? Thank you, Dasher. Anyway, uh, no, talk about the sheets or whatever. I'm going to go. My Sheets Rock created the regulator sheets, which are designed specifically to keep hot sleepers cool and cool sleepers comfortable. They regulate temperature, wick moisture, stay breathable, and are so soft you'll sleep comfortably every night. That's because these sheets are made from best-in-class bamboo rayon, which transfers body heat two times more effectively than regular sheets and reduces humidity by 50% so you can experience your best night's sleep yet. It's true. Anna and I got a pair when My Sheets Rock became a sponsor, and they quickly became our favorite sheets. We've bought four new pairs since then. That's why I, Eli Bosnick, personally endorse My Sheets Rock. But I don't know. What if I don't believe you? Don't believe me? Because you're a liar. Don't. Who I hate. Sorry, I don't know. I I got into a weird character. Don't 
believe me? Their 2,200 five-star customer reviews speak for themselves. Plus, they offer a 90-day risk-free trial and free shipping and returns. Check out MySheetsRock at MySheetsRock.com slash scathing and enter our code scathing for 10% off and free shipping. That's MySheetsRock.com slash scathing. Code scathing. All right, Noah. Thanks. Now, you guys know that the air that comes out of a jet engine is like hot, right? What? No, it's not. Google it. Uh, huh. Would you look at that? Thousand degrees. Yeah. We almost died again. Yeah. And now back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, on the day this episode releases, they're going to be unveiling a new seven foot statue of Billy fucking Graham in the U.S. Capitol. <sighs> and if, if you're thinking to yourself, wait, is that the same Billy Graham that said AIDS was God's punishment for homosexuality, told Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights leaders to pump the brakes in 1963 and urged Nixon to do something about the stranglehold the Jews have over our country? I want to assure you that, yes, that is the bigot in question. He is being honored with a bronze fucking sculpture in the very heart of our democracy. <sighs> Okay, I, I know this isn't the point. You said seven feet tall for the statue, but Graham was like 6'2". Mm -hmm. They're making him a little bit bigger for a statue, like 114% scale. It's weird. Well, they're uh, they're accounting for all the dead bodies he's standing on, Heath. Uh, no, they're not. No. <laughs> <He's much laughs> That's taller, fair. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so one of the perks of statehood in the U.S. is that each state gets two statues in the Capitol building of prominent people from their state. And, and if you look through the list, it's really a weird mixture of who's who and who's that. So anyway, up until 2018, North Carolina's honorees were Charles Brantley Aycock and Zebulon Baird Vance, both avowed white supremacists. But in 2018, Democratic Governor Roy Cooper decided it was time to highlight some of North Carolina's other bigotries. So they voted to have the statue of Aycock removed and replaced with the aforementioned anti-Semitic homophobe. Okay, which bigotries are okay, Noah? You're making this impossible. <laughs> I checked, and New Jersey state statues are a traffic jam and snooky. So. Yeah, no, so not a lot of people know <laughs> Go that. Go New Jersey. I like that Ohio stole Thomas Edison from Jersey because he was born there. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Now, I, I should be clear that this isn't really a church-state separation issue. The $650,000 price tag for the statue came from the Billy Graham Evangelical Association, not the state. And Billy Graham is hardly the first religious figure to be honored with a statue in the Capitol building. Uh, he's not even the worst. Utah devoted one of its statues to Brigham fucking Young, whose order to exterminate the Timpanogos tribe in the Utah Valley might not even have been the worst thing he ever did. But the whole idea that North Carolina is going to finally get around to replacing their egregious bigot with a different egregious bigot is plenty enough to earn our ire without a constitutional violation. OK, there's got to be a more woke answer than Billy Graham. Like they don't have a, a moderate Confederate general. From <laughs> <laughs> OK, but Georgia should put their Martin Luther King Jr. statue like a foot behind him, just glaring yeah, at it, right? right? Sort of turn, yeah. turn it into a living diorama. <laughs> right. A fun fact, actually, despite being the state that gave us MLK and Jimmy Carter, Georgia used their statues to honor the vice president of the Confederacy and the guy who first thought to use ether as anesthesia. Anyway. Uh, uh, speak not great. No. <laughs> yep. Yep. And they wouldn't do uh, they wouldn't do Rosa Parks. We like the Congress had to do that separately yep. and just be like, we're putting Rosa Parks in there, assholes. Yep. Now, speaking of which, in case you're thinking this is a situation of, you know, who the fuck else are they going to honor? I want to remind you that North Carolina is the state that gave us both John Coltrane and Thelonious Monk, not to mention Maya Angelou. And ooh, ooh. yeah, I mean, Maya is still alive and they ooh, only do dead people statues, ooh, but three of them. Right. But Maya, she's she's fucking 86. How much longer can the living thing possibly last? Exactly. If she's willing to get into a tub of shellac, we won't even need to make a statue, <laughs> oh, Maya. What? And honestly, look, if the alternative is Billy fucking Graham. Yeah, put it like a statue of Zach Galifianakis or Mr. Beast would be better. Exactly, right? yeah. like, I, like, I feel like they could have found a more worthy recipient. Love a Mr. Beast statue. <laughs> <laughs> and in He Is Risen news, sometimes here on The Scathing Atheist, a news item comes across our desk that just feels made for our program. Mm -hmm. Ben Shapiro announcing to the world that his wife told him a wet vagina is a disease. Four Seasons Total Landscaping. And now, a priest in England who was reprimanded for announcing to the parish that Jesus died with a boner. Okay, weird, but it's either that or the Son of God died 
flaccid or <laughs> he died half chub. Those are the options. Like, what do Christian people want the answer to be? I feel like, I feel like half chub, right? It's just, it still looks bigger. But anyway, he so, could have. But right. I, like, what, one way or the other, <laughs> they're getting back to talking about Jesus's dick, and that's a good thing. I recently learned that 17th century Vatican librarian Leo Alatius theorized that the rings of Saturn were actually Jesus's foreskin risen into the heavens. And we need more of that in our theology, damn it. We need more Thank dick you. stuff in our theology. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. So first off, big thanks to Patrick, who was the first of many, many listeners to send <laughs> yeah, us this right. story to scathingnews at gmail.com. Uh, you were all correct. Usually I promise podcast listeners like a reward for sending us atheist news to scathingnews at gmail.com. But this week you get to hear about Jesus's boner. So, you know, sometimes the labor and the reward are one and the same. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> now, to be fair to Father Thomas McHale, the priest at Our Blessed Lady Immaculate in Black Hill, Consett, County Durham, he was not going for a roast when he took to the pulpit for Good Friday. He was hoping to imbue the sermon with seriousness and gravitas by graphically describing the crucifixion. And one of those graphic details is that when crucified people sag under their own weight, all the blood rushes to the bottom of their body, which can result in an involuntary erection, which led Father McHale to solemnly intone to a church full of families on Good Friday, apparently, <laughs> quote, yes, Jesus died with an erection. But it wasn't voluntary? And that's important. I don't understand the point he's making. I, I want to know how it sounded to him in his head before he said it, right? <laughs> it's a great right? question. It is a great question. Who Maybe is he not bouncing those men. off? That's yeah, <laughs> what I was going to say. Who is he not bouncing these off of? So, yeah, obviously families at the service were not pleased with this announcement <laughs> and a complaint was filed. A spokesman for the Diocese of Hexham and Newcastle told the Times, quote, a complaint was received and has been investigated in keeping with our diocesan complaints policy. The investigation has been very recently completed and the complaint is upheld, end quote. It's upheld. So now Father McHale gives a sermon with like a correction about the penile state. <laughs> God, like what happens now? What does that mean? Right. How many Hail Marys even? And what the fuck did they investigate? Right, Thank right. You. We look good. Hey, <laughs> crucify me and check my dick, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, I bet they were just relieved. This was like their easiest priest talks about a boner case they've yeah. had in years. <laughs> yeah. So, good news. Father McHale has not lost his position, though he has gained a dedicated fan in our podcast. One last thing about this story. Uh, if you don't know, it's Matreon, and we're hitting you pretty hard this month to join or upgrade your pledges. But if you needed one last push, to give us your hard-earned cash, let it be the site of this week's podcast script, which patrons can do over at patreon.com forward slash scathing atheist because the photo every single news outlet has <laughs> run of Father McHale, which I have included in our notes, is so fucking funny. It's like you asked AI to generate a grainy photo of a guy who just told a congregation that Jesus died with a boner. It's, <laughs> it's like they took the photo right after he said Jesus died with a boner. It's incredible. Boner. Classic. That's him. Absolutely. That's him. Yep. It's 100%. <laughs> yep. And in missionary composition news, a public school in Louisiana led a local church group into the building, already a huge problem, <laughs> and that group passed out a biblical propaganda book to all the kids that compares premarital sex to slavery. Ah, yeah. you hate to see it. And unless they're talking about a very advanced role-playing scenario in which everyone involved is super <laughs> cool with it, that's a bad lesson for the sex ed curriculum. Also, this was an elementary school, so yeah. it was a bad lesson. So bad, yeah. So the, the truly fucked up thing here is that the aspect they're most likely to get in trouble for is teaching Louisiana school children about slavery. <laughs> oh, God, that's actually maybe true. <laughs> and a big thanks to one of our intrepid listeners for sending us the story at scathingnews at gmail.com. But more importantly for helping expose the insanity. Just in case there's any need for anonymity, we'll call that listener C-Money. The school in question is- C-Money! Lessie Moore Elementary in Pineville, and C-Money has a kid who goes there. 
And when that kid came home with a book of Christian fuck propaganda from elementary school, see money immediately contacted the FFRF and also Hemant Mehta, who wrote an excellent article about it. So here's what happened. Members of Journey Church came into the school and gave out copies of something called The Life Book. It's made by Gideon's International, the hotel Bible people, and it presents biblical lessons, but it's very intentionally crafted to appeal to a teenage audience by giving those terrible morality lessons a uh, youthful twist of hip, Dope, fat, raw, whatever. It's so stupid. <laughs> All right, so a C segment waiting to happen. Thank you. Put, yeah, put exactly. that on the list. Yeah. I mean, I was going to read it just to find out how much riz this Jesus fellow had <laughs> anyway, but uh, it's good that we'll get to talk about it on the show. Yeah, so Hemet's article, which is linked in the notes, mentions a few examples from the life book to give us an idea of what we're dealing with. And it's dumber than whatever you're picturing. Instead of showing entire sections of the Bible, they have little summaries along with handwritten annotations in the margins from hepcats that are just like you as a teenager, by which I mean printed annotations in scripty fonts from fictional kids that say super rad stuff as understood by old Christian white guys who wrote this propaganda book for sure. Yeah, exactly. For example, in the story of Adam and Eve and the snake, it starts by saying, snakes can't be trusted. And then there's a margin note that says, totally hate snakes, Tay. <laughs> then it says, Adam and Eve thought it over and trashed their trust of God and chose to trust the snake Satan and took a bite of the apple. And the margin note there says, I know what it's like to make bad choices when it comes to trust, V. <laughs> okay. V got molested by his pastor, no? Yeah, exactly. This is going to be used as evidence. Also, are they hoping kids will think Taylor Swift contributed to their youth <laughs> Bible? Like, what's that? For sure. They're trying to hack that a little bit. And here's the section about premarital sex. It starts with a mention of Romans 6.16, which says approximately, if you present yourselves as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. So, so there's bad slavery and good slavery. Solid yeah. lesson. Good work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we get a relatable story from the made-up Tay character, pretty sure, from before. It says, quote, I have a really good friend who thought she and her boyfriend were ready for sex, so they went ahead and had it. They had it, is the exact phrasing. She thought it was love, but found out pretty fast that it wasn't. She gave up her heart to a guy who didn't really care and dumped her a few weeks later. But then she figured that since she had already had sex once, it wasn't a big deal to do it again and again and again. This is what being a slave means. Is it? No. I don't think that's what being not. a slave means. Nope. But it says that's what being a slave means. She couldn't stop herself, even though she hated herself more and more every time she had sex with another guy. That's why I think God saves sex for marriage, Tay, end quote. It sounds like Tay's friend is getting some really good dick and love in it. I just a good honor, right? Just you, use protection no matter what Eli says, but good on you. <laughs> Raw dogs only. Condoms are slavery. Okay. Nope. So condoms are slavery. In response, <laughs> they held me back from the microphone. In response to all this, now. the FFRF <laughs> sent a letter to the school explaining what the fuck is wrong with you? Or something very close to that. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully there's a voice of reason at the administration level. We'll see how it goes. Regardless, some amount of damage is already done. The absurd age inappropriate propaganda is terrible, but also this is some other damage. Based on the photos posted by the school, we know that they made the kids listen to a terrifying Christian guy sing and play the guitar. So it's a... It's a Geneva Convention issue as well. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Podcast listener Heath has put a picture of this guitarist in our notes. And if ever a haircut said, I'm against premarital sex, <laughs> it's this gentleman. <laughs> he has predator bangs, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. what those are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And on that note, we're going to pause for a word from this week's second sponsor, Factor. And voila, duck à la orange. All right. That's pretty awesome, dude. Right? Hey, guys. What you doing? Eli showed me his private chef in a box. Oh, you talking about Factor? No. Uh, what's Factor? 
Great question. Factors, fresh, never frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. So no matter how busy you are, you'll always have time to enjoy nutritious, great tasting meals. Wow, that sounds great. But do they have variety? They sure do. With 35 different meals and more than 60 add-ons to choose from every week, you'll always have new flavors to explore. It's true. Factor sent us a box to try when they first became a sponsor. I love the food and the fact that it's ready in two minutes means I'll still eat great on a busy day. All right, Heath, I'm sold. Where do I sign up? Head to factormeals.com slash scathing50 and use the code scathing50, scathing50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code scathing50 at factormeals.com slash scathing50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. Nice. Thanks, Heath. So, wait, if you didn't mean factor, what's what's a chef in a box? Well... Kidnapped Cecil again. Kidnapped is such a strong word. It's the one the cops use, man. Yeah, I do. <laughs> And in Predators and Prayer News, prayer, we have a story about the Vatican. During a speech in Rome last week, Pope Ruby Soho, by the punk band called Francid, Pope Francis, decided <laughs> to... <laughs> it's getting long. It's getting long. He decided to go off script and tell a story. And I'm pretty sure he ended the story with a vague book style accusation that people inside the Vatican are trying to kill him with the magic of negative prayer. It does seem that way, yeah. Well, good. Good. We're running out of <laughs> nicknames over here. Move on to a new old guy. It's been yeah. like 10 fucking years of this shit. <laughs> sure, yeah. And a big thanks to Stormy Decisis for sending the link to scathingnews at gmail.com. So let's start with a discussion of the Pope's comedy style. Apparently, he has one go-to joke, and he fucking loves it, and he usually finds a way to work it in when he's talking to someone. When he meets a follower, at some point they usually say something like, I'm praying for you. And that's when he says, for or against. The joke being like, I'm such a rogue of a pope. I'm super divisive by not having all the old bigotry, just most of it. So maybe you prayed for me or maybe you prayed against me. Uh, that's what he thinks the joke is. Obviously, the joke doesn't work, though, because... The setup includes, I'm praying for you. So when he says for or against, <laughs> lots of people must be like, for, what? I, just I said, said, uh, said for. <laughs> but regardless, the power of prayer is the context here. We have billions of religious people across the world who think there's an epic cosmic tug of war based on wishing magic. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Pope, by the way. If a person is known for the one joke, it's either because that person isn't funny or it's because that person was counting on me to edit that joke out of the show but didn't explicitly tell me that he was. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. Sometimes it's both. Sometimes it's both. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, that bit... Ben Shapiro's wife told him what have a joke. Now, to be fair, it is a better bit than the Dalai Lama's suck my tongue thing that he does for the kids. No, you're so, right. You know. no, that's true. Yep. Okay, so here's what happened during the speech. He was addressing a conference that was organized in hopes of getting the birth rate in Italy back up. Apparently, a big problem in the world is not enough Italian babies. So they had a conference. Weird job to give to a celibate guy, though. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So he finished up his prepared remarks, and then he launched into a personal story while his handlers started panicking, I'm sure. According to Frankie, he met a wise old lady after a recent speech, and they had a conversation. She gave him her recipe for age-defying ravioli. And as usual, oh, nice. he did his little joke at the end. It's genetics. <laughs> <laughs> and after he said, yeah, pray for me, not against, at the end, she responded by saying, be careful, Father. They're praying against you inside there. And Francis pointed over his shoulder toward the Vatican as he told that part of the story. Then he said, clever, huh? about this wise old woman. So I'm so curious, like what the fuck is happening in the Vatican? Do you right? think he thinks he's being murdered? Well, what I, what I really hope it is, is just rooms full of old men going, me, 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 but with like homicidal theory. There's right, definitely exactly. some of that going, yeah. Also, don't you talk directly to God, man? 
right? Is he telling you about this behind your back, homicidal <laughs> praying? Right? Like, hey, man, I don't want to make things weird between you and Giuseppe, but yeah. this is what he had to say about you the other day. You can't, it's a HIPAA violation for you to ask about his <laughs> homicidal praying to me. I think you deserve to know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah he kind of framed it like a joke what francis did but i don't think he was entirely joking i really don't i feel like he's walking around the vatican very carefully like head on a swivel at the very least he's worried also separately i must admit his go-to joke is actually funnier than i would have guessed from you know an 87 year old vol cell dressed like an uncut penis sure. funnier than i expected it shows that he's at least a little bit self-aware about his absurd position as the conduit of the God of the universe. Now, um, just sell the Nazi gold and pay the victims also. There you go, yeah. If your God's not telling you what I just said, you're talking to the other guy. <laughs> right. Or you're lying. Ooh, there's a chance. And finally tonight, in theological swift news, one of the weirder challenges you get as an atheist activist is what you would replace religion with. And first off, that's a weird question. Like, I feel like maybe we don't need to replace our child molesting tax-free institutions of Bronze Age morality at all. But what the asker usually means is what we'll do to replace the community, how we'll replace a sense of belonging and an excuse to gather. And while the answer for me is fucking board game night, uh, it could Ooh. be a lot like the church service, which drew thousands of first-time parishioners of a variety of faiths last week in Heidelberg, Germany, a church service themed after pop superstar Taylor Swift. Okay. Ooh, also for Tay-Tay. But lose the church service. Like, they're so close mm -hmm. to getting the point. Just do event themed after music. It's called concert, and we've had this technology for a while. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, look, church plus X is always worse than just X. That's a universal yep. truth. Yeah, exactly. So first of all, I want to thank the Religion Media Center for bringing this to our attention. If you like Atheist News and you're here, so I know you do, you should check them out. They're especially good for international and UK-based stories. And you can learn more at religionmediacenter.org.uk. That's a center spelled like you're a communist, though, though, R-E. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they're not perfect. So I want to say at the outset that any religious service that starts with a priest solemnly intoning, sometimes... I feel like everybody is a sexy baby <laughs> is automatically my favorite religious service that's ever taken place. But that doesn't necessarily make it a good thing, right? The service is an attempt to appeal to young people as priest of the service and self-proclaimed hobbyist DJ Vincenzo Petrica put it, quote, I think the church still has good answers to the important questions of life, but they are often packaged in a way that younger generations do not understand. It is not their language, end quote. Yeah, like for example, young people bristle at slurs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and this is not Petreka's first jukebox service. Previous services have been themed after Michael Jackson, apropos, Madonna, and Bob Dylan. But none have been as popular as this one, which drew 1,200 hundred attendees from all over Germany and sold out within a matter of hours. Okay, good work. I actually checked for Tay-Tay conspiracies in Germany based on this, and I didn't find anything. I guess I'll give it a couple of weeks. Something's going to pop up. <laughs> She's a psyop against idiots without even trying, just by existing. It's amazing. Right. Exactly. But if the hope was that the church would become the new vaping your jewel, it doesn't seem to have stuck with young people. When asked if they would come back, two 13-year-olds who were attending church for the first time at the service said, quote, if there's another Taylor Swift service, yes, but we wouldn't go to a normal service. We're both not very religious. <laughs> quote. We were actually doing the paying attention version of just pressing the X button real fast during all the religious bullshit, but uh, you have your fun. So, yeah, probably not the revival Father Patricka was hoping for, but the most important thing about this story is that it leaves us here at The Scathing Atheist with no choice but to put 10 seconds on the clock. Hymns at the Taylor Swift-themed <laughs> church service go. Oh, Jesus. Okay, I don't know that many hymns. Um, Agnus Dei te, 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 te. <laughs> Boo. Where is thy tayfulness? There like, we go. Okay, I'll take the easy one. Boo, Amazing. Already. 
amazing taste. Did we all three just make the same fucking joke? All right. Well, so yeah. I, with apologies for not coming up with more shit for him and Taylor Swift, both of which I literally know less about than organic fucking chemistry. We'll wrap the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Taylor's version. And when we come back, <laughs> we'll hate read a little more C.S. Lewis. Can I have some more, star? In a second. Be patient, Dude, man. you have to put him away. Come on. Hey, guys. What you doing? Eli's doing body horror again. Keith, Kevin is right here. Look, man, I'm right here. Okay, Eli, what's with the human head sticking out of your pocket? Come on, guys, his name is Kevin. And for your information, I was jealous of the Stamps.com mobile app. What is the Stamps.com mobile app? It's like having the post office in your pocket, wherever you are. Take care of mailing and shipping wherever you are, even on the go with Stamps.com mobile app. All you need is a computer and printer. They even send you a free scale. And you can easily schedule package pickups through your Stamps.com dashboard. Automatically see your cheapest and fastest shipping options from different carriers. I mean, that does sound great. Exactly. That's why I shrunk down Kevin from the post office and put him in my pocket. But does it save you money? Oh, no. It was a painful and expensive process. No, I, no, I mean the, uh, the Stamps.com app. Oh, yeah. The Stamps.com app, yes. The, uh, the app does. Uh, you can get rates that you can't find anywhere else, like up to 89% off USPS and UPS. Plus, you can order shipping and mailing supplies, labels, and even printers from the supply store when you run low. All right, Eli. I'm sold. Where do I sign up? Make the same no-brainer decision as over 1 million other businesses with Stamps.com. Sign up with promo code SCATHING for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code SCATHING. All right, Eli, thanks. So, Kevin, how do you even get you in there? I was forced into a, a kind of a tube. Asked and answered, got it. I'm in a lot of pain. Sure. Yeah, no, that makes yeah. sense. That's the tour. Right. For years, we resisted a breakdown of C.S. Lewis's mere Christianity because many believers and ex-believers warned us that it was actually pretty good. Well, 90 pages in, I'm comfortable saying those people were full of shit, which we learned yet again <laughs> in this installment of... God awful books. So in book one, Lewis proved to his own satisfaction and nobody else's that there had to be a God. Now in book two, he's trying to establish that it's specifically the Christian one. And we spent the first three chapters pointing out all the other gods don't make any sense. And now he's going to try to bring it home by pretending that Jesus does. So we're going to pick up the just who is this God person anyway conversation with book two, chapter four, the perfect penitent. So he opens up, he's like, okay, so either Jesus, this is a quote, either Jesus was what he said he was, a lunatic, or something even worse. <laughs> like, oh, even worse than a lunatic. Oh my, right. my God. Also, I've seen a lot of dishonest appraisals of the liar, lunatic, or Lord apologetic, but it takes a genius like C.S. Lewis to come up with, and also not a trickster demon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, this whole thing is just to establish that Jesus Christ wasn't you know, like a normal human good teacher is what he says right at the end of the last mm -hmm, chapter. Mm -hmm. Who are you arguing with, though? <laughs> and whoever it is, stop talking to them. They're going to sell you raw milk in like five right? seconds. They Go are going to sell you raw oh, milk. Shit. It's true. So, yeah. So, and C.S. Lewis is like, you know, before I was a Christian, I thought redemption on the cross was silly. But now I think it's less silly. And I'm like, oh, way to commit, Clive. Okay. To be clear, an abusive alcoholic created humans with flaws and then decided to do a genocide. But his son was like, hey, dad, you want to torture murder me instead, huh? And it worked. <laughs> if that's the story you're going with, you can't medium believe it. Yeah, right? You kind of need to yes. push all your chips in there, bud. C.S. Lewis is either a crazy person or a demon, according right, to yeah, his own right, mind. Right, yeah, or Lord. Yeah. So he's like, you know, look, we don't know how or why Christ's death redeemed us. We just know that it did. And I'm like, how can you know it did if you don't know how or why? 
Yeah, he dedicates this whole paragraph to explain it. I don't understand how salvation works on the subatomic level. I leave that up to the scientists. <laughs> but I know it's true, and that's all that matters. Skip me, 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 me. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's okay that they don't know what the fuck they're talking about because people, you know, people had to eat before they understood what vitamins were, right? It's like that. <laughs> and that's why every single person is Christian, even though we haven't figured out, like, Christo Flavin vitamin theory, right? Right, yeah, yeah right. Just like how right. Everyone no. eats food, but he's like, he's like Christianity though. It's like scientific formulae, and I'm like, in what way? He's like, in that I don't understand them. <laughs> Truly, yeah. <laughs> I think the point he's trying to make here is that, like, look, scientists don't count the quarks to know how a specific scientific principle works. They use math and logic. But to be clear. They counted the quarks first, right? It's not like, <laughs> and, and it's not like Lewis is going to be using math or logic well, right, at any exactly. point. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He's trying to set up an analogy. The analogy is formula is to scientist as Christianity is to. I was told there wouldn't be math, is what he learned. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. it's, yes. You got to have two things on each side, bud. If you start with two, the other side has to have two. You went for a really stupid analogy, but didn't quite rise to that you level because yeah. you yes. didn't get, get an analogy to happen. Right, yeah. His no, But his theory of the case is that he actually doesn't need a theory of the case. He's just right. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> Real quote. Any theories we build up as to how Christ dead did this are, in my view, quite secondary. Mere plans or diagrams to be left alone if they do not help us. And even if they do help us, not to be confused with the thing itself, end quote. And I wrote... Are we sure C.S. Lewis wrote this and not Lewis Carroll? I'm getting right. real Lewis Carroll vibes. <laughs> okay. Uh, snack. Unicorns are actually made of leprechaun cum or not leprechaun cum. Either way, unicorns are God. Stop questioning the cum. Right. That's an analogy. Yes. Actually. So I actually got it all. Yeah. No, actually, you, you did better than he did. So it, like, he's like, look, if God made sense, that would actually disprove his existence. Yes, he keeps saying that. <laughs> Reminder, C.S. Lewis thinks a coherent God is exactly what Satan would do. Yes. And that's how they get you. So <laughs> Christian God had to be absurd instead so you know he's real. Right, but so, okay. So, but after three pages of like saying like, you know, Christianity stays true even if the underlying theories are proven false, he offers up those underlying theories. Right. So the theory, of course, is that Christ offered to bear all of the punishment that we sinners deserved for us. And actual quote of the book, quote, on its face, this is a very silly theory. And oh, sure is. I mean, that's how we know Satan didn't make it up, though. So good start. <laughs> yeah, it's important. Uh, yeah, you got to check. But he so he points out the like, who would God be paying the debt to contradiction? He doesn't answer. He just points it out. He's like, well, okay, well, maybe it would make more sense if you think about it like paying a bill. And I'm like, but not really, though, because because again, who would he be paying the bill to? Right. He says, quote, if you take paying the penalty, not in the sense of being punished, but in the more general sense of standing the racket or footing the bill, what? then of course it is a matter of common experience that when one person has gotten himself into a hole, the trouble of getting him out usually falls on a kind friend, end quote. But that's not true if the person they owe is you. Right. right. You know what? I'm a good guy. I'm going to break Steve's knees instead. All right. <laughs> right. But uh, don't, don't go telling people. Uh, don't think of it like some kind of evil, vindictive penalty. It's more like somebody owes me one genocide. <laughs> and then Jesus apparently like folded himself in half and slid himself across the table at his death <laughs> to negotiate that down or whatever. Yeah. Uh huh. Weirdest refi of all time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but so he explains the need for Jesus. See, the catch is that only good people can repent really well and only bad people need to repent really well. So Jesus was the good person repenting for all the bad people. And I'm like, oh, well, now it makes th sense. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I nailed it. It all checks out now. Sorry, you said you paid my bar tab from 2000 years ago when I wasn't. And now you want to call in that favor? Yes, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, he, he then he addresses, but the like, you know, but if it's God, then dying isn't dying question. And his and his answer, as far as I can parse, is, hey, look, just because he has plenty of money doesn't mean a PlayStation 5 isn't still an awesome gift. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just to be clear, the all-knowing God came up with a workaround 
for the problem that he created. He was like, mm -hmm. I'm going to die for these idiots to teach him a lesson. Wait, fuck, I can't. I can't die. Gabriel, find me a 12-year-old girl. I'm doing a thing. Don't worry <laughs> right. about it. Tell her you've got good news. This is going to be funny. Tell her you've got good news. <laughs> but but his analogy misses the objection entirely, right? He says, like, you know, the fact that dying was easy for God doesn't matter because everything is easy for God or whatever. But but it's, it, the, our point isn't that it's not easy. It's that it's not dying, right? right? If you right. know you're coming back, you're not actually, like, without the suffering, the cross is just unconventional furniture, dude. Yeah. Also, it's not like you stopped being God while you were Jesus dying, right? You just like triumvirated yourself. And then that part of you kind of died, yeah. but then got to keep it's nothing. It's not right. It's right. But having established that Jesus works, even if we don't know how he moves on to chapter five, the practical conclusion. Fuck off. Oh, dude, his editor told him he couldn't name the chapter common sense rightness. Yeah, so. right. Right. <laughs> God pones atheists with facts yeah, and logic. Yeah, right, logic, using yeah. this one simple trick. He starts off like, he's like, so I think we can all agree Jesus died to atone for our sins, moving on. And I wrote in my notes here, I'm like, well, to be fair, if he had to actually prove something to move on, he'd never get to move on. <laughs> That's so. true. He'd still be in the <laughs> intro being like, people liked my radio show. Right. <laughs> he actually says, the perfect surrender and the perfect humiliation were undergone by Christ. But... I feel like even Jesus himself would admit the crucifixion boner made it a little confusing to call that, you know, <laughs> yeah, in terms sure. of humiliation points. But then he has this unusual and inexplicable fucking is weird if you think about it paragraph in here. <laughs> it's an entire paragraph by a British theologian trying not to say booby or whatever and start giggling as he runs away. It's right. so weird. Yes. You know how sex makes you kind of, uh, it kind of, you know that? It's like that. That's how God is. <laughs> it also sounds like he's very much never had sex or even seen it, right? 100%. Yes. This is a big bag of sand Absol vibes right absolutely now. Absolutely bag of sand. But he's trying to play along, you know, like with the kids on the bus, just repeating the last word they say while they're <laughs> about sex but it's like it's him saying stuff in his book being right. like yeah he's got no one to sex agree sex is weird weird <laughs> weird exactly weird yeah right feels like a bag of sex he's like you know God's hard to puzzle out but if you think about it he made sex and if you had to guess you would have never guessed that your dad came into your mom and then she pushed you out of her vajooch and I'm like no that's 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 true I guess he needed an example of a thing that God made that was weird and the example he landed on was fucking. <laughs> For instance, why does one always think about the strapping farm lads down in the market just before they come? <laughs> Mysterious ways, my friends. Mysterious, Mysterious ways. Strapping farm lad. No, but the, the point is God made sex. Sex is weird. God made Jesus. Ergo, making Jesus is this probably weird too. Loving Jesus is like... Is jamming my soul in the couch. <laughs> yeah. Right? So he explains here that there are three things that, quote, spread the Christ life to us, end quote. Baptism, belief, and, quote, that mysterious action which different Christians call by different names. Holy communion, the mass, the Lord's Supper, end quote. And I have to ask, how long do you think he's strained to try to come up with a category name for that shit that started with a B? Yeah, exactly. A big old <laughs> Jesus dinner? Fuck, yes. why isn't Heath born yet? Oh, Heath would have one. Yeah, right. God damn it. Biscuits, biscuits, idiot. Oh, oh the, the biscuits of salvation. Yeah. So, he's like, you know, none of this makes any sense to me at all. And I'm like, why are you writing a fucking book about it then? And he goes, then again, I don't understand coming and I have kids. So it's it all it all works. Well, he he's got stepkids. Did I say come right before I said step kids? Yeah. <laughs> it's like baby clay right yeah okay because this is my question how much does c.s lewis not understand coming because the way he has written about it in this chapter like like he has no idea how coming works and i worry for him right right, I, <laughs> right. he says well, you, so so now i've explained why i have to believe that jesus was and is god and i'm like i don't 
I don't think you were talking Mostly about just sex. Talked about how you don't know how sex is. He's doing that liar thing where they try to keep slipping in weird lies to rewrite reality so they weren't wrong or shitty or whatever. And if you don't grind the conversation to a halt every time and correct their delusion, they think it's become established fact now. But yeah. they don't usually do that in a book where we can see it all happen. It's tough, yeah, it's tough <laughs> to slip anything into conversation in a book. We I'll can tell flip you. back. Uh. You know about that, right, CS? He's like, I believe all of this stuff that Jesus said on Jesus's authority. And I know, I know people say, oh, you're taking it on authority. But trust me, that's that's OK. And I'm and I'm like. Believing on authority is fine. Trust me, is one hell of a statement. <laughs> yeah. man. It feels like an Orwell quote a Republican would use wrong. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Trust, but don't verify. It's Ronald Reagan who said that or like Stalin doing an old proverb. It doesn't matter. Christ is God. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on. No, but he explains that in addition to baptism, belief, and communion, you have to still be Christ-like. I'm not spending another long weekend trying to think of a B word. This is, just, <laughs> this is just another thing. Also, it's a different list. New list. Do christening, conviction, and communion. You could do any letter you want. Oh my God. Right. They have to let you. Have you. A whole album. He'd be so mad. Two C's. Oh, he's rolling over in his grave right now, man. You just don't know. His, his generations feel the pain from that, Heath. <laughs> the very next letter, man. So he's like, but he's like, but much like you can't fuck yourself into existence, you can't be Jesus-y without <laughs> Jesus's help. And we're like, fucking what? Dude, Sorry, what, my friend? <laughs> this book is a, a sexual journey that I was not expecting about C.S. Lewis. <laughs> now it feels like he heard about masturbation and he's trying to find out if it's actually real without asking directly. <laughs> so he's like, okay, obviously you can't make like a little homunculus of yourself in your in your hand you'd need your parents help with that right my co-host is nodding yeah <laughs> anyway it's the same with knowing christ that's what i was gonna say guys this is held up as a masterwork of apologetics guys of course <laughs> it is literally worse than case for christ and i never thought i would say that about anything right yeah honestly <laughs> he goes but this is why christians are better at goodness than other people i'm like woof but the Christians are better because, like you know, they're being good in hopes of getting a reward, and other people are doing it just for the sake of not being assholes. Yes, real quote again, because I want to be clear: Noah is not exaggerating. That is why the Christian is in a different position from other people who are trying to be good. They hope by being good to please God if there is one, or if they think there is not, at least they hope to deserve approval from good men. But the Christian thinks any good he does comes from the Christ life inside him. He does not think God will love us because we are good, but that God will make us good because he loves us, end quote. Yeah, and then he continues, almost exact words, Sorry, was that insane and impossible to follow? Christians, I'll give you an example. Christians are like the roof of a greenhouse. We just sit there and the sun makes us better, maybe. The sun is God. Yeah, right. Yeah. I did a full analogy. Fuck you, Heath Enright. <laughs> he goes, when Christians say the Christ life is in them, they don't mean, and I'm like, do Christians say that? I don't think they do, CS. <laughs> You know how everyone uses my great catchphrase, boy, yo, 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 yoing. Uh, it's like that. <laughs> so you could check it out at boy, yo, 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 com. But he says, he says, when we say Christ is in us, we don't mean he's teaching us. We mean he's a literal magical ghost that remote controls our soul <laughs> to some degree. Sorry, was that insane again? Humans are a swarm of nanobots that make up the physical body of Christ, <laughs> like Christ fingers and Christ muscles and Christ That's his point. cells were the three body <laughs> things I could think of. Again, almost exact words. And then he explains how the nanobot thing is the reason that bodily acts like baptism and communion aren't silly and stupid. It's not just spreading an idea with the belief part. And then again, this is a quote. It's quote, more like evolution, a biological or super biological facts. Super biological. And, <laughs> so Christ is like gremlins and also zombie cordyceps yeah. is the theory here. Right, right. He's like, it's not just that Christians learned new shit from the Bible. It's that we're actually better people than other religions. Like in an evolutionary sense. He actually says in an evolutionary sense, like, man, this is pretty fucking ubermensch for being during the Holocaust that you wrote it, man. Yeah, man. yeah it's got real, I'd like to point out I was on your side all along vibes. <laughs> yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. 
He goes, no, look, communion makes sense because God invented eating <laughs> so he can really do whatever he wants with it now. Yep. That's a real argument in the fucking book. It is. Seriously, he says, quote, God invented eating. He likes matter. He invented it. So like anything with matter is a point for my team from now on. That's the actual argument from C.S. Lewis here. Oh, yeah. Under the assumption that if God made something, he must love it. Okay. That, <laughs> that creates some problems for you. He does tackle the do people who've never heard of Jesus go to hell question. His answer seems to be, we don't know. Moving on. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that would bother me more. Huh? Right? Yeah. Before I wrote my apologetics book. You'd hope. Yeah, and so there's another objection he has to address, which is why wouldn't God just use his infinity powers to defeat Satan and rescue us? And his answer to that is he's totally going to do that any minute now, actually. He's, he's warming okay. up for it. I laughed at that for a while when I read that part, right? Because usually the answer to that question is fallen world or free will. And C.S. Lewis's answer is that God's going to get to it like a basket of unfolded laundry. Right. Just, yes. Are you sure? <laughs> yes. Seeing you grab your socks out of there, C.S. Well, Lewis. But, you know, but no, gonna... but see, God <laughs> wants to check and see if we really side with him over the literal prince of evil before he rescues us. His analogy here is insane, too. He's like, well, think about it. You know, we wouldn't think much of a Frenchman who waited until the end of the war to declare which side he was on. And I'm like, OK, man. How much would we think of the allies if they'd waited to invade the mainland just to see which Frenchies were really on our side? Exactly. Right. And it's then insane. burned all the Frenchmen who died before they were on our side in fire forever? Yeah, right. <laughs> Maybe analogies aren't your thing, bud. Maybe you just shouldn't do those. Just to be clear, God's the allies and, and God's watching the Holocaust in this analogy. And now... He's looking at one French atheist and and tapping his foot, being like, I can do this all day, French atheist. <laughs> <laughs> also, I created the Holocaust because I'm God. That's you making an argument for your thing, yep. C.S. Lewis. That's insane. Sure the fuck is. Yeah, and, well, and then he's like, well, you know, look, God doesn't want to invade early because when God invades the earth, the whole world's going to be destroyed, right? So you'd want to save that for the last thing that you did. And I'm like, but it's going to be replaced with eternal paradise, though. Yeah, what are you waiting? Man. No, guys, there's this show called Mad Men that's going to come out. <laughs> and it's, you do not want to miss that. I like to just pull the socks out as I go. <laughs> All right, well, I'll tell you what, that ends book two. And as far as C.S. Lewis is concerned, we have proven that Christian God is real at this point, And now we get to move on from there, which we'll follow along with in the next installment of God Awful Books. Before we power down tonight, I want to remind you once again that it's May. That makes it Matreon, and that makes it a great time to become a sponsor to up your pledge to the show. Our patron-only pajama party live stream is coming up on June 8th. Will we have to get coffee enemas for that? Well, that's up to you. Be sure to check out Matreon.com to learn more. That's May with a Y, because we're always adding new goals. Anyway, that's all the blessed we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptic Guide, being at 7 Eastern on Monday, and even new episode of our sister show's Hot Friday God Awful Movies, being at 7 Eastern on Tuesday. Tuesday, and even new episode of our half social show citation needed to be at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I can't convert this file before I thank Heath Enright for always bringing his A game, Eli for always bringing the board games, and Lucinda Illusions for always bringing just game. I also want to thank Bane Shakes Charlie for providing this week's Farsworth quote. I'd love to offer a link to his YouTube channel in the show notes, but he didn't send me one. So hopefully I can add that next week or you can find him the old fashioned way. Speaking of which, last week I misidentified the Farnsworth quote providers Instagram. It should have been at Rich Rawl, R-A-W-L, not Richard. So that's at R-I-C-H-R-A-W-L. And no, I promise I am not trying to Rick Roll you. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's most marvelous Matreons. Will Jet, Robert the Wooden Dudas, William David talking about the big stuff, other Robert, wonderful, pretty sure the Beatles song Fixing a Hole is about Thomas Dog, Reed, David, George Bartlett, Bambi votes for positive change while embracing menopause with catitude. <sighs> Yes, I'm allowed to take a breath when a bunch of people just start doing whole sentences instead of names. I think I don't have to do it in one breath at this point. Andy, Tony, Akari 13, Melissa, Nigel, Zhangxi, Princess of Power, Chelsea, Ashley, Joseph, Peyton, B. Duns, Michael Plaid, Jason, Jim Sparrow, Tony D., actual Tony D., Andy, Danny, Matthew, do you have data but want a dashboard and said, Parzival, Shay and Evan, Laura, DJA, and Portly Monteau, who are so hot, Mercury gives up. 
Together, these 41 people, sentences, and direct challenges to my autocorrect helped inch that coffee a little closer to our asses this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give some to us, but if you do, you can make a per episode donation to patreon.com slash getting atheist, whereby you'll learn only access to an extended ad free version of every episode, or you can make a one time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but not in a money giving kind of way, you can also help a ton by leaving a five star review, telling a friend about the show, and following us on social media. And speaking of social media, Tim Robertson handles that for us. And our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you can find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. Don't worry, Heath. I checked. It's not like a holiday for children who died. I was of wondering. I, I, honestly, I was about to ask you exactly that. Eli. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved.